about Jesus in the New Testament. As you know, the writers of the New Testament, the writers of the Gospel, did not write a biography of Jesus Christ. You know, you can go to a bookstore, you can buy the biography of Mr. Bush, Mr. Clinton, uh, you can buy the, the, the president of the Philippines, or you can, you can buy biographies of great people, and then you have a descriptions of their life, their child, their, their upbringings, you know, everything. But the Gospel of Jesus Christ is not a, a biography of Jesus Christ. Do you know the colors, the color of the hairs of Jesus Christ? We assume that it's probably the color of most Israelites, okay? Do you know if he has a big nose or short nose? <laughs> probably big because eh, in this part of the world it's big. Do you know how tall he is? Is he 5'8", 5'11", is he 6'3"? Do you know that? Do you know the color of his eyes? The food that he likes? What he did that uh, when he was uh, 18 years old, you know, you d we don't know that because that's not the purpose. The, the writers of the gospel, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they wrote what is important, the message of God for your salvation, for your sake, so that you will know the things that, that counts and make a difference. And part, a very important part of, of the gospel are healings. Many, many acts of powers that are healings. And why? Why the, what we call the synoptic gospel, Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that these three uh, are similar and, and repeat so, some of the same uh, miracles. But at the same time, each writer do not include all and will bring their own specific that is not mentioned by another one. Why is it important for this writer or that writer to choose and be selective for this healing and not that one? Otherwise it could all be the same, isn't it? So there is a purpose. And if you've been a Christian long enough, you have heard that each of the four Gospels have been written uh, with an intention, like a target audience. Like uh, Matthew has been uh, writing to the Jewish, that's why you will find so many mention. And this, pro this is to fulfill the prophecy of. This is to fulfill the prophecy of. You will have a lot of it in the Gospel of Matthew. And each Gospel have a target audience. And because they are having a target audience, they are selecting certain miracles that will be appealing or making sense to the people uh, of that of that group. So we, we understand that. But why healing? What's the purpose? Are the healings of the, the main goal of healings in the, the gospel, um, a purpose, the per main purpose is to help my healing ministry. So this is, you, you need to do everything that Jesus is doing so that it will help your healing ministry because you know Jesus spit in the face of someone for healing so if you want to learn how to heal somebody then you need to learn how to spit in the face of someone or, or how to make uh, the, the, the light, uh, right mix of mud and put it on the eyes of someone or put the ears, uh, your finger in the ears of someone and say oh hi me I put my, my finger in your ears today I'd like to bring healing to you or you know this kind of thing so probably the healings mentioned in the Bible is not really to develop my healing ministry. Do some pastors and ministers, there's always something to learn. I mean, we can learn something from everything. But there's another uh, purpose, probably more important. In Judaism, nobody has ever healed like Jesus did. The priest would be there to confirm healings to be witness of healings that God would have performed and to do some uh, uh, ceremonial washing of, of these people that would receive healing. And the Jewish thinking of the time, uh, illness, disease, was not really to be cured. Why? Because in the mind of the people, it was caused by sin. You're sick, it's because you sin. That's in the mind, not saying it's, this, it's, the, it's a fact, I'm saying this is 
at the time of Jesus, a common uh, concept that people had at the time. Um, God was not happy with them so that their life was surrounded with sufferings. You know, at Jesus' time, many people died at 35 years of age. Not like today, 70, 80, and no more. Many mothers would be dying and giving birth. Many babies would be born dead at the time. Lepers would be shouting, unclean, unclean. And they were perceived as very, very bad sinners, especially the lepers. Um, remember in the Old Testament, there's a reason why in Jesus' time people had this kind of concept. If you think about the lepers, do you remember in the Old Testament who became lepers? Who? Naaman, okay. Who became lepers in the Old Testament? Miriam. Why did she become lepers? She rebelled against Moses. Okay. Who else? One of the prophet's servants. Gehazi. I don't know if I pronounce it properly. Uh, Elisha's servant. Why did he become lepers? Because of lie, because of cheating, because of greed, and he become. So it is easy to assume people who knew this story from the Old Testament. Miriam got leprosy because of rebellion. Gehazi because of cheating and being greedy. So it's equal. All lepers are lepers because God punished them because they are sinners. And then it becomes like an accepted view of the society at the time. They are bad. So that's why. So leave them alone. They are bad. And you know, why were they shouting, unclean, unclean? Was it because of the fear of spreading the disease? I used to think that, but more recently, I, I, I read and I, I learned that it was not so. That it was because of that perceived uh, concept that society had and they themselves had of themselves. They accepted it. I am a leper because I'm under God's curse. I'm under God's uh, judgment, so I'm unclean. Don't touch me, don't come close to me because you will be um, um, polluted and then you would become yourself, you know, un you would be undefiled and then you will be ab ab not able to, to come to the temple. Unclean, unclean, don't come near to me because I'm not, I'm not wor worthy. They would tore their clothes and remain in that, in that sense of really unworthiness. So what happens when Jesus comes? He heals them. He loves them. He changed their lives. He restores them. And he does not only heal them, but he removes the stigma. Jesus really came into this mentality to change that mentality. To, through his healing, he, he changed. He says, listen, you people, you think this is what it is. It's not like this. And he was showing us God is not like this. These people need help. They need love. They need to be touched. They need God's grace. I have not come to punish. I have come to save, restore, and remove the stigma that society had given over all of them. You know, when Jesus came to heal, if people would think that the people who had disease were under God's curse or judgment, then it is normal for the people in general to think, Jesus, what right do you have to heal? Who do you think you are? You cannot undo what God has done. If these people are under God's judgment, who are you? Because you know, people didn't know that who Jesus was. They didn't know he was God. They had to learn it. And through the healing ministry of Jesus Christ, there was like a, a process of discovery of who Jesus was. But at the time, they didn't know he was Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus of Nazareth, who are you? What right do you have to undo what God is doing? If these people are under a curse, so why are you touching them? You know you should not touch them. Why do you heal them on the Sabbath day? You should not. This is breaking the law. Why, why should you do something good for them if they are under the judgment of God? So all of these questions were legitimate questions that people uh, w would have. Do you think you're God? 
and then Jesus would let them answer by themselves. Are you suggesting that I am? And there was the debate. If you read the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John is a series of debate. Who do you think you are? Who do you see that I am? Who do you think you are? Who do you see that I am? Are you God? You know, do you think you're one with God? And then they would take stones and throw it. Who do you think that I am? And that question is asked many, many ways on many forms in the Gospel of John. It's a series of debate. There are not many signs in the Gospel of, of, of John. But there's a lot of debates, a lot of arguing, a lot of serious debating of words and, and attack and counter-attack and all of this about Jesus' identity. So these healing were signs given to us. To the writers of the New Testament, they were signs. I explain before what signs were. Signs were, healing was not the goal. Oh, you see, Jesus healed that person. That's it. No. The sign was to point to who the healer was. Why? What authority the healer was. Why, why, why was he doing that? Forcing the question in the mind of people, who is this person? What's so special about this person? So I want to give you quickly three stories. We will just look at it um, very quickly, the first one is in Matthew 8, 5 to 10. It is concerning a centurion, a Roman soldier, an officer in the army. Lord, my servant is very sick at home in bed. He cannot move his body and he has much pain. And Jesus says, I am willing to go with, with you and heal him. Lord, I am not good enough. I am not worthy of you to come to my house. You need only to give the order, the word, and my servant would be healed. I knew this because I understand authority. So this, this, this is very interesting because this point, first of all, this man represents the enemy, the nations that oppress the, the land. He is an enemy. He is a non-Jew. But he understood something about, about, about Jesus and his healing ministry. Of course, he has heard of Jesus before because he says, I know that you can. You know, so, so there was something already. Uh, how did this man perceive Jesus? He believed in authority. He was a soldier. I have authority above me and I have authority over other people who are under, under me. I understand authority. Jesus, you don't have to come. You, at a distance, the word is enough. You have the authority, the kind of authority, your word is enough. My servant will be healed. What an encouragement to us. You know, this is so important, this is so vital that we read these stories and we are so familiar with these stories. And familiarity brings contempt. It's just like, yeah, yeah, so what? I read this story how many times? If you've been a Christian for 20 years or 30 years, how many times? times have you read these stories? How many times have you heard sermons on these stories? You know, but it it's, can even be read and being bored. Like you may think about what you're going to buy, what you're going to eat, uh, what you're going to, to do tomorrow or in your summer vacation. Your mind can be 10 miles away, 100 miles away, or thousands of miles away when you read these stories. But this is a wonderful story. This is a wonderful story. It's about authority. And the healing of Jesus are going to show us today from what right do you have, Jesus? What authority do you have? And here is a pagan, a non-Jew, who understands authority and he understands the authority of Jesus Christ. Do you understand the authority of Jesus Christ? When Jesus says, go into the world. When Jesus says, lay your hands on the sick in my name. Do you understand Jesus' authority? Because there is authority. Jesus has authority. Who, who is this man that can say a word? And for us, how many times we pray for our loved ones who are away? Can Jesus have the same authority today in all of this? So this story is about authority. The second story is in Matthew 9, 18 to 19. It's a leader of the synagogue. So he's a religious man. He's a leader of the synagogue. And he says, my daughter has just died. 
this is this is the most horrible situation if you are parents can you imagine the pain your your heart is broken your you all your ribs are closing over your heart and you are in pain that is the end but this man there's something amazing in this story my daughter has just died but if you will come and touch her she will live it's like that is the end you, you cannot go to Jesus and ask something like that it's over but not to this man to this man it's like Jesus you can do beyond you can do the impossible you, uh, you I still have hope I know you can you have the authority over the impossible you have the authority things that cannot be done you can do beyond that's the authority and the power of Jesus Christ this man had this understanding this is the story continues and then you know that you, you, you know these stories and the, the three gospels they are told and in between when Jesus is on the way this woman with the issue of blood comes in this little story that is inserted right in between and then you continue in verse 23 Jesus continued after this other healing he continues with the Jewish leader and went into the leader's house. And look at the last verse. Not a lot of details. Matthew doesn't waste words. He held the girl's hand and the girl stood up. And if you look at the other stories, there will be more. What he said, how he touched, he talked to the parents, what give her, give her food, talita kumi, you know, this is, there's a lot of other details, you know, over that. But m not to Matthew. To Matthew, he held by the, the hand, and she stood up. That's all. Why? Because the rest is not important. It's not about the healing. It's not about the method. It's about who Jesus is. He has just demonstrated that he has power over the impossible, he has power over death. That cannot be higher, greater, that, that, that. you cannot think higher than that. Your brain will explode if you, if you, if you try to understand more on that, okay? Not a lot of details about this. Unfortunately, we have again become so, f so familiar with these stories. The writer of the New Testament have written for all generations of Christians that we need reaffirmation. We need to, to hear that story again, over and over again. We need to be refreshed. We need to be reminded. We need to uh, remind ourselves, who is Jesus? What can Jesus do? Over and over again, because we go through successions of different kinds of trials and adversities and impossible situations in a lifetime. When you're single, when you are at universities, you are concerned with your studies, with your exams and everything, you get married, whoa, wow, it's a, the, the house is like a, becoming a war zone maybe sometimes. And then when you have children, then another level of, uh, of situation comes, the sickness and the, the finance, you know, and everything, then tragedies can happen. And then you move on with successions of impossible situations where you need Someone that's bigger than you. Someone that can be there for you when you need an impossible solution to be solved. You need someone. And you have someone. Amen? So you need to be reaffirmed always by these stories of who Jesus is. That's why the writers demonstrate Jesus' authority over significant illness and even death. The third story is the two blind men. The two blind men. You see, we, we don't have a biography of Jesus about what he likes to eat, what restaurants he chooses after church, you know, whatever, you know, things like this. But you have a descriptions of what a, a day in the life of Jesus can do. Jesus, you know, goes with this man to his house. On the way, there's this lady with the issue of blood. Then he raised this girl from the dead. Then he says, he left the girl home. Okay, that's enough for a day, isn't it? That's a, that's a great day already. Let's go home. Uh, we've done everything we need to do. But no, two blind men followed him, followed behind him, shouting, Son of David, have mercy on us. They went 
right into the house where he was saying. So he leaves a house where there's a resurrection from the dead. Then he goes into another house. And then they follow behind with their needs. What lessons do we get in that story? These men were blind, were they? Okay. How was blindness seen in Jesus' time? Let me ask you a question. Was there any healing of blindness in the Old Testament that you can remember? All of you are expert in the Old Testament. You are expert in the Bible. You've read it all. Do you remember any healing of blind people in the Old Testament? No, because there is zero of that. Okay. So isn't that the proof? That God doesn't heal blind people. That blindness must be a very serious offense before God. I mean, these people must have done that. And we see this mentality very clearly discussed in John chapter 9. When the disciples ask Jesus, is it his father or is it him who sinned that he was born blind? This was really in their mind. This was part of the society at the time. People at that time had this concept. It was part of the culture, you know, and everything. So these people, the blind person themselves, felt, felt that rejection, the weight of that shamefulness, and how people perceived their... their conditions, they also perceived their own condition in the same way they are part of the same society. So when they come to Jesus, they call Jesus, have mercy on me. What, what are they asking Jesus? Are, are they asking, Jesus, Jesus, give us our sight. Jesus, you know, you know we're blind. Help us to see again. Is it the words that you read? No. What are they asking? Have mercy. Okay, so what is it used for? Because we can interpret it in the two ways. J Jesus, have compassion. You know we're blind. Have pity on us and heal us, which may be all, you know, the intention of the questions. Or it may also be just like the publican who prayed at the temple, you know, hitting his... his breast and saying, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. They are sinners. There are never been any healing of blind people. They have never seen it, they have never heard it. God has never healed blind people in the past. And now they come to Jesus, have mercy on us. So is that Lord, we know our own sinfulness, we know we are under the judgment of God. Lord, re remove that, have mercy, we're not worthy. May, may it be that this, this call for mercy was only that, not a request for healing, but a request for the mercy of God, just the mercy over us. I think this is more the second than the first one. But Jesus does both, and you see Jesus doing both in many of the stories. He, do, he deals with the sinfulness of the person, the shame and the guilt and everything, and he deals with the physical also. Do you believe that they can, you know, help you with your sight? Yes, we believe. Okay, because you believe that I can, here it is, and you, you have it. So this story is really great. It's really great. You know, that's why Jesus is touching their eyes. He touched their eyes because he has authority. He breaks the law. He, he goes beyond what people in the society would do. He touched the untouchable. He, he, he does that to make a point so that we see, we watch his life, and we understand something. If Jesus is God, then he is showing us a side of God that we didn't know about in the past, in the Old Testament. In Judaism, we had not understood that side of God. And here he is, he is confronting the social concept of his time. He is forcing people to change their mind and thinking different. That's why he is rejected. He is really, really rejected. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. The first sermon of Jesus Christ. You know, do you think that Jesus is a good preacher? Hello? Is he a good preacher? Would you think Jesus is the best preacher? 
Yeah, we have to think so. Huh? So what, what is the mark of a good preacher? Okay, and for me, a good preacher is like Peter. He preached, how many thousand accept Jesus? That's wonderful. Here Jesus just come out of the wilderness. In the power of the Holy Spirit, he is just filled with the anointing of God. He goes to the temple. He overcame the devil. And he preached his first sermon. That must have been the most anointed sermon ever preached. So you see, wow. And he is doing it right, doctrinally right. He is quoting Isaiah perfectly. It's like it's a strong message. It's, it's biblical, we will see. It's very positive. He is telling people what the Messiah will accomplish. He will heal, he will open the eyes, and he will do things, all this. How was his sermon received? Remember? They want to kill him. Oh, I thought Jesus was a good preacher. His first sermon, and everybody wants to kill him. They want to throw him down the, 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 the cliff. What, what went wrong with his first sermon? Did he preach the wrong message? Did he, did he do something wrong? No, he did not. But what he says, he says the Messiah will do these things, positive things. He will bring these kind of blessings. But what he said at the end, he applied it and he says these blessings will also be included over the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. And the, the Jewish people at the time says, no, you are not from God. You cannot be from God because God will only bless the Jews. He cannot bless the pagans. They are cursed. They don't are not loved. We are the holy nations. We are the descendants of Abraham. God will bless us, but he will not bless them. So you are not a prophet from God. And they want to kill him. Confrontation. Concept. Can God be merciful? Jesus introduced to us the, in the Sermon on the Mount, remember that he gives the rain to the grateful and to the ungrateful. The good and the wicked receive the same blessing from the land, from the sun, from the rain. Everybody receives the same thing from God. God gives to, to everyone, doesn't make exception of person. In Ephesians chapter 2, he breaks the wall of enmity between Jewish and non-Jewish people, brings them all together to become one not only a blessing to the Gentiles. Okay, it would be a, a, a thing to say, okay, you Gentiles, I will bless you also, and you Jewish, I will bless you also, but you cannot come together because you are, you are impure. I will bless you, but you are impure. No, in the New Testament, I will bring you the two to become one. So this is not possible for the Jewish mind of that time to accept. So one more confrontation, one more confrontation. That's what happened into this one. Jesus come. In that story, Jesus also, uh, even though he quotes Isaiah, he left out part of the text from Isaiah. Right after the year of the Lord's favor, there's a part about judgment. Jesus doesn't quote it. He finished it on the positive. A year of the Lord's grace, the Lord's abundance, the Lord's blessing, the Lord's favor. And he does not quote about judgment. Because the Son of Man has not come to judge. People are already judged. People are already in sin. He has been sent not at that time to bring a work of judgment, but a work of redemption, a work of salvation, helping, restoring, bringing back to life. So first of it, Paul, he doesn't quote part of the real quote. And second time, I never realized it before, but he added to the quote something that I had never seen before. The part for the recovering of sight. This is not in the original Isaiah chapter 61. And why did Jesus add something to that quote? Because it was central to his ministry. The New Testament always point to us that the blind always recognize Jesus faster than those with eyes. 
they, they, they come to Jesus, they bow before him, they say thank you, they, they cry, have mercy on me, they, they go after him, son of David, they, 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 they see something in Jesus that the others do not. For us in the 21st century, it is difficult, we miss many of these things, but Jesus came to restore the outcast because there was a stigma over their the disease and their illness. And when Jesus come to uh, uh, recover the sight, to bring a good news, he removes the stigma, the, the fact that these persons are being like unclean, uh, ceremonially unclean, uh, separated from society, dirty people, separate from me, you know? If God rejected you, what am I going to do with you? How am I going to treat you? Keep you at a distance. That's what I will do. If you're ill, don't come to the synagogue. It's not a place for you. Because here we are God's blessed people. You are being punished by God. Don't come. And Jesus comes. He says, no. I'm restoring. I'm removing that separation. All, all that concept. I'm breaking these concepts. To do something. on do, To do good on the day of Sabbath. What is the Sabbath for? Sabbath is not like... A set of rules so that you cannot do more than so many steps in a day. You cannot uh, pick up so that paper. You cannot cook your food. You cannot. That's not the idea of God. The Sabbath is a day of rest because you've been working very hard under the sun. All human beings and animals also. The Sabbath is a day for animals also. It's a day where you rest in the Lord, where you Think about the Lord, where you spend your energy, where you refresh yourself. So it's not about how many steps, how many actions you can or cannot do. It's about rest in the Lord. Jesus understands all of this. It's about doing good. It's about, you know, being in tune with the Lord Jesus. And, and, and this is what he, he is doing here. You know the woman with the issue of blood, that is the part we, we skipped. You know, she could not get married. She could not hold children. She could not have children. She could not go to the temple. She could not be a teacher. She could not have a job. She couldn't do anything. She couldn't have money. She couldn't do anything. How many years? Twelve years. She spent everything. She was desperate. She was unclean she was separated and Jesus removed the stigma what do you think made her the, the happiest the healing oh I'm healed Jesus thank you I think yes it, it made her very happy but what made her happier is that she could now hug someone she could kiss the baby's cheek she could get married or she could have children or she could go to the temple and praise the lord with everybody else without being pointed at the door and she can be a testimony and people says hey she was the lady that for 12 years we would not come near but now look god has blessed her she's been healed you know and being glorifying god for that that is the happiest you know, thing that for her, not the healing, the, the, but the, the removing of the cause of the stigma for her. So Jesus has done it. Not the happiest was the healing, but the effect, the effect of the, the removal of that. You know, I have tasted a little bit of that a few years ago when the SARS came to Hong Kong. You know, SARS was very bad in Hong Kong at that time. And um, my wife and I, we went to Canada in July. But you know, in May, the World Health Organization has announced when the temperature will reach, I think it's 27 degrees, there will be no more SARS in the world. Like it, it, it will finish it, it will, it will stop it completely. So that was already early May, May, June, July. So we normally go to July, August. So we went to July, August. There were, for a few months, not a single new case of SARS. It's over. We have been through that here in Hong Kong with our mask and we didn't know how to protect ourselves and all this. So, so we've been brave, we've been bold, we, we went through that. So now it's July, there is no more case of SARS for a few months. Come to Canada, people were afraid. <laughs> we may, you know, pass SARS to their children and they didn't want to see us. 
and we couldn't see, come near the children because maybe their children would go and quarantine and all of this. And we were trying to argue with them, no, don't you know, after 27 degrees, the World Health Organization said there's no more case for already two or three months. You are, you know, you don't understand. But fear was more important, a concept that people have if they are not educated on something is you, you can tell them whatever you want. If they are still in doubt, it's not working. Your arguments is not working. So that's what we see in Jesus' time. People were having these concepts and Jesus walked in their life. Who are you? What authority do you have? What do you think? Who do you think that I am? And this is what Jesus has done with the law. He, he healed people on the Sabbath day. He come to the Sabbath. He healed that lady who was banned for 18 years. And the ruler of the synagogue is angry. There is six days to work. You heal on the six days, not on the Sabbath, because you're breaking the law. And Jesus is coming strong against them, you hypocrites. You, you, you bless your donkey on the day of Sabbath. But this lady who has been the daughter of Abraham for 18 years in pain. You will not do something good for her. And another story says, is it, is it lawful to do harm or to do good on the day of Sabbath? And Jesus asked these kind of rhetorical questions because the answer is clear to all of us. So this morning in closing, I just want to, to refresh you with these stories. The purpose of this healing is to establish your faith, to, to convince you that your life, your, your giving, surrendering to Jesus, that your future that your impossible situations are not impossible anymore. That whatever you're going through, that you need to be reaffirmed with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me this morning? Hallelujah. Who Jesus